welcome to The Fix. I'm Michael Walker. Apologies for a particularly long wait today. We were all ready to get go at 8pm and then it turned out we had no sound and you can't have a news show without sound. Uh, I'm joined today by James Butler who is going to tell us all the revelations that have come out of the Paradise Papers. Don't you think a news show without sound would be refreshing? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll, go, we'll go into that later. We won't. Um, we'll also have an interview later with Suzanne Moore about what the sexual harassment scandal in Westminster tells us about gender politics in wider society. First, an update on what is going on in Westminster, what has come out over the last eight days uh, since last weekend. It's obviously in the wake of the horrific allegations against Harvey Weinstein. A light is being shone on widespread sexual harassment and abuse in Westminster. On the Tory side, Allegations include those against Michael Fallon for sexually harassing two female journalists, along with making lewd comments to his cabinet colleague. Uh, he has since resigned, stating his actions had fallen short of the high standards expected of the armed forces. He doesn't seem to feel the need to resign as a, constituents M a constituency MPs what he thinks are the standards of British seven voters. Oaks. is still <laughs> unclear. Is it Seven Oaks? I yeah, didn't actually know what his constituency was. Also, we have Stephen Crabb, who sent suggestive messages to a 19-year-old who'd applied for a job in his office. Michael Garnier, who'd called a female assistant sugar tits and got her to buy sex toys for his wife. Michael Garnier, who called a female... Oh, that's the one I just did. <laughs> Christopher Pincher has been accused of sexually harassing a Labour MP and making an unwanted pass at, Olympic, at an Olympic rower whilst wearing a bathrobe. The rower Alex Storey described Pincher as a pound shot Harvey Weinstein. Dan Poulter has been accused of inappropriate behaviour towards three female MPs and putting his hand up the skirt of a woman in a commons lift. The list goes on and on and on. It goes all the way up to Damien Green. What does this Damien Green, who's been accused of uh, inappropriate pass at a journalist and also having extreme porn on his parliamentary computer? Uh, the Damien Green, I mean, all these events are horrible, but there is one event that's come out of it which I quite like, which is when you get a Tory cabinet minister against the police, which means that one of them has to have lied. It's a lot like when Andrew Mitchell <laughs> allegedly called a cop a, ple a pleb, and then there's a debate, one of them's lying, I don't really care which one comes out worse in this case. Can they both case. lose? They can... In the end, James, they will both lose. In the end, they will. What does this tell us? It appears Westminster is full of more than a few entitled men who use their power and privilege to prey on usually younger men and women. It shows the fact that these have all come out now and not earlier, shows that either women were too, uh, didn't feel confident coming forward with these allegations, or that when they did, they were systematically ignored. In fact, we know it's both. We know that Dan Poulter was reported by a fellow MP in 2010, but the complaint was completely ignored. That's by an MP. Imagine if someone complains with less stature than an elected representative in the House of Lords. We also know that Theresa May got regular updates about the misdemeanours of her MPs and a source close to the PM said that sexual harassment was often tied up with affairs and gambling addictions as just another, just another naughty thing that can be used to win votes in the House of Commons. Of course, misogyny is by no means limited to the political right. Uh, there's also been awful allegations that have come out in the Labour Party most prominently Bex Bailey last week, who came out and said that a senior official in the party had raped her and that when she'd gone to an official about that to report on that, they'd told her to... So I'm getting slightly distracted by TV over there. They had told her that it would damage her career if she went forward with it. There's also been allegations against Clive Lewis, Ivan Lewis and Kelvin Hopkins, all of whom have denied them. What should we do when there's an allegation against someone who otherwise might have the politics we agree with it's completely obvious you take that claim seriously. You do not assume it's a conspiracy. At the same time, you don't assume they're guilty. Due process is important. Talking of due process, the Labour Party have clearly failed in this regard in, in the past years, mainly by ignoring victims of abuse like this. I spoke earlier to Rhea Wolfson, who sits on the NEC, about the changes that the Labour Party have promised to make I started by asking her what concrete agreement the NEC came to last week about how Labour can change in the future. This is Rhea Wolfson from Glasgow. 
We know harassers and abusers are in every industry, in, in every section of politics. The issue I want to focus on is how it's dealt with by the party. Uh, yeah. Clearly, Bex Bailey was quite specifically saying that the current procedures aren't good enough. And many people have come out agreeing with that. What changes are the NEC going to be making so that this can't happen again? Yeah, so what has happened recently is we've changed the procedure. So um, I think there was there was a lot of complaints before that people just did not know. So people were very low to make complaints because they didn't know what was going to happen once they did that. And people were understandably low to start a process that they didn't understand. So what is now available, which I think is a really positive step forward, is an exact breakdown. It's available on the Labour Party website of exactly what will happen once you either call the hotline that we set up or email the, the complaints email. Um, these will be handled at first by one called Sophie Goodyear, who's the head of complaints. Um, I've asked that as much as she's happy with it, that, that name is out there, some people know that they're not just emailing a blank inbox that's going to be picked up by anyone. That's not the case. Um, so now people can understand that process and it's also clear within the process that you can either go down a formal or an informal route depending on, on where you're comfortable and also that um, victims will never have to face um, the person that they're accusing. Um, as a, we've heard, that is a, a huge problem for people, and so that's clear as part of the policy. Um, there's a lot to happen. Most recently, since um, the complaints have come out, we Labour Party has has said it's going to work with an independent um, expert body to advise in the process, so that we can give advice when people first call the hotline, and to advise us as we go through this process. And um, part of the process is that. People's case will be heard by three NEC members. Um, that's not out of the whole. There's a, a whole NEC. There's a small group of NEC members who will be specifically trained um, by external organisations to prove to hear these different cases. So, you're saying three people on the NEC will be trained about how to deal with complaints. One of the things that was specifically brought up by Bex Bailey was that women feel it's more difficult to come forward when they think the person who's judging the case might know the accused. People on the NEC are some of the best connected people within the party. If you feel like the person who's abused or harassed you is high up in the party, how can people have confidence when the person judging that claim may well know the person who, who harassed them? Yeah, I think what, what's clear as part of the policy is that all cases will be anonymised before they go to the NEC member, uh, before they go to, to that, that panel. Um, it will then go on to the NCC, which is our body. So if it's going to disciplinary, this is getting a bit a bit technical, but the NEC doesn't have power to um, make any kind of conclusions in terms of disciplinary action. What it refers to is the, the National Constitutional Committee, which is a body that's been hearing, you know, that's always been in position to hear disciplinary cases, and they're much less, you know, NECs become a bit of an infamous, bo infamous body where people know exactly who's on it, whereas the NCC is removed from that process to make those judgments. But cases will be anonymised. Look, I think it's a conversation that, that we have to have because it has been raised, fair enough, by people who have been victims. So it wasn't part of the discussion that we had when we passed this policy. But if it turns out that the people who are victims of these awful, awful experiences, that is their, that is what, the, what they want, then I think we have to have that, that discussion seriously. Um, I at least hope that people can have heart in the policy as it stands for now. And in terms of what punishments we should expect, are we expecting slaps on the wrist, people to be given an opportunity to change, or are we expecting zero tolerance and expulsions for any instance of harassment and abuse? Yeah, again, it's it's ultimately it's it's a conversation for the for the NCC to to have on that. You know, I would be incredibly disappointed if we ended up seeing slaps on the wrist. You know, we have to be safeguarding our members. That's the priority. And ultimately, in a lot of these cases, what it's going to that what that results in is people have to be removed from party structures, um, and particularly people who have abused their power um, in the past. If this is people who have held positions either as employees or um, CLP position holders, um, they cannot we cannot be in a position where it allows those people to continue to have power in our party. Um, but it's, there's, there's a wide range of options available. And again, part of the Shared Party Report to always come back to it, talked about how we need to have a better process because it used to be you either were suspended or you weren't or you got a warning or you didn't. And that was it. And actually what the Shared Party Report recommended is we have a much better process of dealing with that. And that also means that we shouldn't encourage lifetime bans from the party except in exceptional circumstances. So if people have made kind of historic mistakes, obviously this is very context specific, we should be able to have that conversation with individuals. Um, and, and I do support that, you know,
know, where, where applicable or not in every case, depending on the kind of the severity of the instances. Um, but there's so much to be done in terms of our processes. You know, I think that having this process be very transparent will help. Um, but there's so many things that we have to do in our party to continue to encourage accountability and transparency because it's the only way that people can actually have faith not only in the bodies making these decisions but you know as their lay members coming through the party to make sure that they've got faith that they will always be treated with respect um just so integral to, our, to the functioning of our party and they'll be able to, us, to be able to execute our values we know harassers and abusers of calm and serenity it's a little bit stressful before uh we are going to bring back an old feature one we experimented with Briefly, it's Whopper of the Week, the biggest Whoppers of the Week. Uh, there were some, there were quite a few candidates this time around. <laughs> On Saturday, the leading candidate was Charles Moore, who had this fabulous take on the Westminster scandal. This scandal shows that women are now on top. I pray they share power with men, not crush us. Keep uh, it in the bedroom, Charlie. Keep it in the bedroom. <laughs> On Sunday, this was overtaken by Peter Hitchens with this horrific take. What will women gain from all this squawking about sex pests and niqab? Weird. Uh, but at the last minute, at around 6pm, information was released that one of the world's biggest whoppers of all time had given us another excuse to call him, to call him a whopper. It's the one, the only. It's Bono. And James, this is your cue to tell us what we know from the Paradise Papers. Yeah, well, look, I mean, you could target Bono for many reasons. You know, his vastly overinflated ego. The music, um, the substitution of self-righteousness for politics, I think that's a big one. Mm -hmm. But he, he's here for his kind of cameo appearance in the Paradise Papers. Um, these are, uh, like the Panama Papers, an enormous leak of files from, uh, largely, or, or about half of them are from this big, offshore law firm, uh, Appleby. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's also politically important, uh, you know, that, that it includes uh, corporate registries from 19 jurisdictions as well. So these are registries of companies that are, are in these kind of secrecy jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. And you'd be amazed at what you can do offshore. Um, you know, you can register uh, your, your yacht, mm -hmm. <laughs> your aircraft, uh, you know, uh, uh, your property. Uh, you can even use offshore companies to pay school fees for your children. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, Bono is here. Uh, and this is all done to avoid paying tax, this right? is, Well, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's where, where most of these stories are, are, are coming from at the moment. And the big theme uh, in The Guardian splash on it is, is tax avoidance. But these, these companies can be used for other things as well, and we'll get on to that. Mm -hmm. um, the, the things we're initially learning from them is that, one, is that the offshore empire is bigger than most people thought. This is a really, really huge uh, circuit of companies and, and, and jurisdictions. So it's a kind of integral part of global capitalism as it, it now exists. Um, a big part of that is sheltering the rich from domestic taxation, so it, it sharpens that divide. Really important one politically, though, is that it's legal if it's done correctly. Now, some of these look like they might have been done a bit dodgily, but uh, most of them seem to have done correctly. So the, the political issue is, is, is that OK? Should that be OK? Um, now, Bono, <laughs> Bono is, is here has hit the front page. It's kind of a funny story. Um, because he's invested in this company that was originally uh, registered in Malta, then in the Guernsey, in Guernsey, in the Channel Islands, um, in, in order to, to, for a stake in a Lithuanian shopping centre, where he's sheltering some of his wealth, basically. Mm -hmm. um, so, so uh, when we have Navarra Millions, we, if we had Navarra Millions, we would have done this show from Bono <laughs> to Lithuanian shopping centre. For now, hopefully, there's an image up. Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, the, you know, in itself, it's kind of an unremarkable story, right? Uh, and the reason that it's in Malta is that you pay 5% on, on profits from a company in Guernsey, zero, zero tax from, from, from company profits. Um, but, but it's a small story in itself, but it points to the use of these uh, companies, these offshore structures, by celebrities, by the great and the good, to kind of shelter their wealth. So much so that the other story today about celebrities was about the cast of something called Mrs. Brown Bo Brown's Boys, which I don't know mm -hmm. and have never Stella seen. Creasy is a fan. Stella Creasy is apparently a fan. Um, you can take that as a recommendation or a reason never ever to watch it. Um, yeah, so so the, 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 their wages are being paid, much like Jimmy Carr was through these companies, through these okay, companies yeah. in order to shelter it from taxation. Um, so this is a very very common story. Um, so there's a there's you know a basic story about hypocrisy there. 
basically, the, the reason this is false is that Bono's a wanker and it's mm-hmm. very sad. Always meant to be a story. But the point is that it's very common among the wealthy. Um, Who else is in there? <laughs> well, that brings us on to the Queen. The Queen. The Queen is in there. And the Queen is in there, and, you know, as everyone knows, I think the French have the right idea about the monarchy, but, uh, you know, she has invested, or the Duchy of Lancaster, which takes care of her material. So, Duchy of Lancaster, by the way, founded in 1399 to do this. Mm-hmm. Family. Um, <laughs> they've invested seven, £7.5 million pounds in this Cayman Islands fund, um, which is invested in various retailers, including this, what, this kind of grim rip-off merchant called Bright House, which incidentally shelters their profits via a kind of Luxembourg mm. firm itself. Now, these people kind of rip off vulnerable people by uh, renting them consumer goods like TV for many, many times their work over the course of years. But I think the Queen is interesting because she is the figurehead or like ceremonial figurehead or actual monarch of many of the places in which um, this kind of uh, companies are registered. So uh, British, uh, either crown dependencies or British mm-hmm. overseas territories. Um, and it, that makes sense if you think of the British Empire as having kind of its last glorious gasp of being, you know, uh, oh, come and shelter your money from us. And there being this kind of financial structure where you have um, you know, if you're rich, you're able to kind of come to the city of London and do various things, and then shelter your money in another kind of segmented bit of what used to be the British Empire. Uh, it's also rife among other people in power, uh, you know, eminent reason, like Justin Trudeau, who uh, is also in these papers. Uh, another one type figure himself. <laughs> uh. <laughs> yeah, another one is uh, Wilbur Ross, who is Trump's commerce secretary, uh, himself a billionaire. He's been revealed as having close links to a company run by Putin's family or some of Putin's family, including some who are under sanctions. He's retained those companies while he's holding the post. Um, so, so that will be, I imagine, a big story at some point. The third one I want to talk about is, the, is, is not a tax avoidance story. It's about uh, a loan from the uh, great evil mining company Glencore, uh, who, uh, have, who are on, in the papers as having loaned to uh, this billionaire Dan Gertler um, 45 million in order to secure a mining contract uh, in uh, uh, the Katanga copper mine in the Dem- Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, and the condition is that so it's repayable if that the loan's mm-hmm. not uh, repaid. And, and the suggestion is that those millions would have been used to uh, ease the way through, uh, through the, the, the Congolese government. Um, so, that's, you know, th- this guy, this guy has been cited by the UN as uh, giving Kabila 20 million uh, to buy weapons for his army against, uh, you know, against rebel groups in exchange for a monopoly on the country's diamonds. 2013 report says mining deals struck by the, these companies have deprived the country of more than $1.3 billion in potential revenue. Gertler's very close to the uh, DRC government. His lawyers say, blah, blah, he cares about the poor, he cares about the needy, blah, blah. This is just a standard international transaction. But ultimately, it seems to me that, that you know, if you cared about the poor and the needy, you would be working with Glencore. Glencore uh, breaks sanctions. It broke sanctions in apartheid South Africa. Um, it broke sanctions in Saddam Hussein's Iraq. Um, it has in, been uh, uh, accused of environmental pollution, uh, of poisoning rivers, of child labour in its African mines. And it matters because we knew about these kind of practices. Uh, we knew about them before, and we knew about them before um, as far as Glencore was concerned. But here they are on paper mm-hmm. for the world to see. So this has happened before, right? We mm-hmm. had the Panama Papers, yeah. which again showed us that very rich people try and avoid tax, and also that very rich companies are quite happy to bribe people in poorer countries. Uh, is These are all allegations, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> not, not, not proved yet, or at least I don't want to say I've proved them. Uh, what does having this out in the open change? Will this change anything? And what should the demand be? How do we make sure that this information is translated into action that means yeah. that countries can collect taxes that can be spent on services mm. and that this kind of bribery in developing countries is not possible any longer? Yeah, well, look, I mean, that is the political question, isn't it? And there's a danger that these scandals can be drip feeds where they just enlarge our sense of, like, that's just the way the world is that, uh, you know, this is just the kind of corruption that, that you come to expect, um, rather than building into a wave that kind of sweeps these people away. Um, but, one, I mean, you know, it, one of the things that it reveals is the extent to which we already know this mm-hmm. stuff. 
Um, and most scandals, I think, of the modern age are like this. The expensive scandal, for instance, was like this, that we knew it was going on. Um, you know, and the danger is that it becomes tacitly accepted as like, oh, it's just the cost of doing business. Um, so so it, I think it's important to not adopt that kind of, oh, shrug it off and, and, you know, that's just the way the world is. You can't necessarily do that, do anything about it. Because um, it's not true. Uh, there's nothing socially inevitable or socially necessary or indeed socially good about the existence of billionaires mm -hmm. um, or indeed the structures that are devoted to protecting their wealth. So it's important, I think, because of that. But it's also important because tax avoidance itself, that issue, is hugely important. Uh, it, you know, we live in a culture in which the stories that get told to us, you know, we're all in this together and so on, are just not, uh, they don't match up with what gets revealed here. And it's very easy to become nihilist about mm -hmm. it. Tax avoidance is an acid. It, it eats away at the things that bind society together. It, it eats away at common commitments. When you see people in power saying, I actually don't have to have a stake in this society, it leads to a kind of really destructive political nihilism, a really corrosive political nihilism. So we pull off the veil of secrecy yeah. in these, uh, uh, in these uh, offshore tax havens. Uh, we, we, we refuse or we uh, campaign for a ban on nominee shareholding. So you have to be named on the things that you own. Um, and you enact sanctions against them. You say that any company or any trust that has business dealings with these places that will, you know, that, that, that take this money offshore, well, we're, you're no longer having it. You're not doing business here. Um, and we need, of course, a publicly available register of trust, which Theresa May has just refused mm. to do. Bono, you're a whopper. The Queen, you're a whopper. <laughs> Glencore, you whoppers. And all you, you rich motherfuckers, pay your tax before we expropriate that wealth. Anyway. Uh, one of the reasons we were a bit late today is that our main cameraman, Gary, is currently in Bonn filming Claire Heimer and Dahlia Gabriel reporting on COP23. It's the environmental summit that happens every year and brings together the leaders of the world. And generally, they don't come to any agreements. I know that Claire and Dahlia don't have that much faith in what will get decided inside the summit. They've been reporting from the demonstrations outside. Uh, this is Claire and Dahlia reporting from the social movement's demo uh, at Bonn. My name is uh, Lice Moyama and I'm from Lice Moyama and I'm from the island of Tukelau. I am joining the marching today because we are the first nation to go underwater if we don't stop fossil fuel. So we're here to demand the world to stop fossil fuel and fossil fuel. That's it. Hello, this is Dahlia Gabriel reporting for Navarra Media. I'm here at the Climate Justice March, which is happening the day before the COP23 negotiations begin. It's obviously really great to see all these people out here showing solidarity and trying to show an element of civil resistance to climate change. We're also seeing a lot of the kind of problematic tropes that have been present throughout the history of the European climate movement being reproduced here. A lot of talk of just saving the environment without much focus on the people that are implicated on that and who are the people that are the first to die from climate change. So we're going to go around, check things out and see what climate justice means to the people marching today. Climate change is a reality and it's hitting the Pacific right at the moment and climate justice really is just seeing the world commit to transitioning away from fossil fuels and into renewable energy right now, not tomorrow, today. Climate justice to me means that people who have had nothing to do with causing this problem don't suffer and don't suffer from the fact that other wealthy, rich, greedy, mostly I would say, players have benefited from this system and aren't suffering. Our communities suffer from climate justice because we are depend on our livelihoods. We are farmers and we are growing crops for ourselves. But if there's no rain, then we can't plant. لحد الآن القرارات هي يعني اختيارية اختيارية كما وقع مؤخرا في الولايات المتحدة جاء ترامب وانسحب بسهولة من من المعادات وهذا الشيء إحنا يعني هذه شيء خطير وغادي يوصل الأرض لواحد الكارثة لا محالة منها لهذا إحنا نطالبه 
باش الدول ديالنا والحكومات ديالنا يوصلوا للقرارات ملزمه للجميع انا ذاك يمكننا نتحسنوا بدون قرارات ملزمه فهذا يكون تلاعب وهروب من من المسؤوليه as a, a woman that lives in the pacific for me climate justice is important because it ensures and prioritizes that everyone are included within climate responses regardless of your background your ethnicity your sexual identity and your gender expression and for us we are still strongly pushing that everyone should be included everybody should have fair access to climate um, to climate actions and no one should be left behind My name is... Are we on? I'm joined now by Suzanne Moore, columnist at The Guardian. Uh, you've written some brilliant pieces actually in the last two weeks about the Westminster sex scandal, or the Westminster sexual harassment scandal, it's not a massive sex scandal. I want to start by asking, you've written that there is a danger that this scandal will be minimised, that sexual harassment will be minimised and nothing will change. Can you expand a bit more about what you're worried about here? Well, already today, I mean... So this is just a week and a week and a half of this stuff. We can see the backlash. We can see some of the stuff you referred to earlier on, you know, on, in the Sunday papers. The women who've made allegations like Kate, Kate Mulby are being destroyed in, by the mail. And one of the things that I said is that, you know, we get these kind of mercenaries of patriarchy, often female journalists who come in and discredit other women and say, well, I coped with it, you know. Um, there's that argument, I coped with it, why should anybody, these special snowflakes, complain? Um, there's an argument about that some men are making, how is anyone basically going to get off with each other mm. without harassing people? They seem not to understand that people could indicate interest in each other without actually harassing people. And it's also to connect the personal behaviour to the bigger political behaviour, the structures that people are working in. It's really important to say, this is not just Westminster, this is not just Hollywood, this is happening in a, you know, supermarket in an office. It's a system by which women, often women and younger people without power, are abused by powerful people in their workplaces. What can what's going on in Westminster tell us about other workplaces in Britain? You've written that... This shows that Westminster is finally coming up to the 1970s. Yeah. But do you yeah, think it is qualitatively different what's going on in Westminster? What particularities are there yeah. with the Westminster sexual harassment scandal and the condition of women in, in work generally? Well, Westminster is a sort of small contained environment that operates with its own rules, and some of the things that we've seen are a, a complicity. For instance, the um, political parties will control the way that. The, they deal with this stuff by saying, we've basically got dirt on you. I mean, the Tories are known for it. I'm not saying Labour never does it, but we know we have sort of evidence that the mm -hmm. Tories will say, you know, we know that you're having an affair, you vote this way. So that kind of thing, or you, you like young boys, you vote this way. So that's a complicity and abuse that's set up within a, within a system. And, you know, the other thing is that most people, normal people, when they go to Westminster, feel this is a very strange place with very, uh, very odd, strange rules. It smells really weird. It just smells strange. But a certain kind of person, public school people, go there and feel at home. And what they feel at home with is often being in these kind of single-sex environments where people are really other. I mean, who are these people who cannot be in a lift with somebody without touching them up? I mean, it, mm. it, 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 it's an extreme sort of behaviour, exacerbated by the fact that, you know, as people have said for years and years, it's a place with seven or eight bars, one of the bars is for bishops, so not even MPs can go in, no bars, but, so we've got all these bars, but no childcare, you know, this is, this is the kind of strange organisation of Westminster, and the other thing is a symbiosis between politicians and journalists. Journalists themselves, are, um, the world of journalism is very hypocritical and will trade also on information. So these things all prop each other up and it is not good for anybody. Um, often you get young ambitious people, men and women, who just feel that they can't say anything or just can't cope. One of the things that's really sad I think at the moment is that some people are saying, well, especially these kind of, these sort of harried women who say, oh, I can cope, I can cope. Actually, where are the people who couldn't cope? You know, you just couldn't hack it. You just didn't want to live like that. Mm. And there's a lot of people that, you know, should be in politics, should be in journalism, should be in positions of power, that just aren't. I want to actually focus on that, uh, what you commented on about the relationship between journalists and politicians, meaning that this hasn't come out. Because I actually think that hasn't been discussed very mm. much. It's mm. been written a lot about how 
the whips having a yes, vested yeah, interest yeah. in having secrets on politicians yeah. makes them inclined to not make that a formal complaint because it's quite useful to have a secret on someone. Do you think journalists have been doing the same thing? I think certain journalists and, and uh, have been part of this because of the lobby system. Because if you are locked out of that system, it's said that you can't get stories. Mm. I mean, the only two bits of journalism that I, that I found, find so closed is um, fashion journalism and political journalism. I went to a fashion show once and people were crying because they couldn't get into Versace because they'd slagged off the last Versace collection, therefore they weren't let in. They couldn't do their mm. jobs. And there's a little bit about the way the lobby operates, which I don't think any, any organisation should, especially now, have anything to do with it. They just should not agree to, because it's politicians setting the access and the rules by which journalists operate. And out of that comes all this kind of this kind of quite sideways, bizarre behaviour and clubby uh, behaviour between sort of gangs of guys. Um, no, I think journalists are part of this problem because a lot of journalists have also, in a kind of um, I'm so cool because I know this stuff about people way. You know, mm -hmm. journalists will exchange information like, oh, we all knew he was gay. Didn't you know that? Or, you know, all this sort of stuff. And they will also excuse certain, you know, journalism is also very male dominated, but they will excuse behaviour. Uh, especially, I mean, I'm not talking about the, necessarily the rape, I'm talking about known, known sort of harassers who just regularly wear down women and mm. that happens and uh, it's very hard when you go into Westminster. When I first went to Westminster in the 90s, you know, my editor said, I said, well, how do I get stories? And he said, and obviously it was years and years ago, he said, well, you just wear a short skirt and stand in central lobby and catch the eye of MPs when they come out of discussions, uh, of debates. Mm. And I was what? I mean, I literally stand around and he said, and you're, you know, and their view was, as a woman, you'd have the advantage because you would catch the eye of these... And then they'd take you to lunch and then uh, yes. you'd talk about Lovely. the various yes. things going yes. on in the lobby. And the other thing is And then they might put their hand on your... Oh, God. Leg at and, the the end. Other, and the other thing is this, this culture of lunching, which I was suddenly involved with, which I'd never... You know, not, not something that I'd ever had anything to do with, these uh, long lunches, lots of alcohol. The other thing is that and that has changed in Westminster. They just used to be pissed all day. Mm. A lot of drinking all day long. No, it's, it's true. I think a lot of them still are pissed all day, right? Or is that the lords now? <laughs> the lords and the bishops. <laughs> but you know, no, some are. But it is less. You know, it is less than it was. But you know, you can. The the reason that they they have to be in the bars apparently till ten, eleven, twelve, whatever, is because they're waiting for the division bell. Mm. But what you've got is also a lot of people who don't live with their families. Uh, you know, the, those those ones that get caught having a moment of madness or not knowing what they're doing or whatever. I mean, there must be lo there's loads of them. I'm surprised there's not more of them, really. Mm. Um, it's They do live a very bizarre... We ask MPs to live a very bizarre lifestyle. and uh, But they are completely propped up. They prop each other up. Um, I mean, I heard Caroline Lucas talk the other day about the difference between the European polit uh, Parliament, you know, which is arranged in a circular way, whereas the ours is an yeah. adversarial. So, you know, it used to be that when a Labour woman got up to speak, the Tory guys start weighing her breast. You know, they make that action. Ooh, yeah, yeah, like yeah, that. yeah. Now that's in public. What, what are they going to do in private? Yeah. Exactly. Uh, I think it's easy to dwell on the the kind of repulsive behaviour of these odd, older, rich, posh <laughs> men, and sometimes. What happens is you forget the actual consequences of it, which is that it discourages women from going into politics, mm. it stops people progressing in their careers. Have you seen any progress in the last 20 years that gives you hope that that might change? And what do you think this particular scandal now, these allegations coming out now, will, will change? Well, there has been progress. And obviously, um, the more not all women are going to speak up, and not all uh, women have all will change things, but yeah, we need more women in politics. I mean, that's, that's not in question for me. I am really heartened by the fact that younger women will not, and younger guys, just are breaking this silence and making connections about the structures that they work in and not just saying, um, well, I asked for it or I didn't know what I was doing. They are, they are fundamentally saying, I do not want this to happen to me in the workplace, and they are giving each other confidence by speaking up. And what I hope happens now is that we just that the pressure 
keeps up and it doesn't become really I think you said this it's not really a party political story um, it, it's a it's a huge political story because the next bit has to connect Westminster to to the everyday to, to stuff that women the harassment that women put up with and that's a huge ask because I mean we're talking about patriarchy I mean, we're talking about and, and Westminster, of course, symbolises absolutely the, the heart of power, and, and certain people feel comfortable with that. Uh, but I'm, I am heartened by what's happening now. I mean, it's been a long, long time coming. It does feel like a dam breaking. And I, the strength of it is almost, for me, I can w see it in the backlash. People are trying very, very hard to say, this is a bit of flirtation. And they won't be able to say it when some of the allegations are proved. They mm -hmm. just won't. And it sounds ridiculous at this point as well. It so. does. Um, Suzanne Moore, thank you so much for coming to the studio today and joining us. Uh, this was The Fix. We'll be back in a week's time, hopefully on time. In the meantime, check out Navarra Media's Climate Week all week from Bonn. See you next week. <laughs>